The Sega Mega Drive, the Sega Genesis, it's got two names and I'll have no idea what to call this thing all through this video, but you know what I'm talking about and you probably know where this is going. Yes, I'm going to be taking a look at some games that push it to the limit, games that make it do things that are pretty special, and hey, just for fun, let's see if we can spot some actual stuff that Genesis does, but Nintendo don't. That was the slogan, does it hold any water? There's so many to choose from, it's not going to be easy to whittle this down, but let's start with Ranger X. Released in 1993, the Mega Drive was well established at this point and had a reputation for games that had a bit more hardcore appeal. And that's exactly what this is, a super tough run and gun shoot 'em up hybrid with some interesting and unique mechanics that put it many miles away from those mascot platformers that dominated this era. Is it good? Well, yes it is if you can handle the difficulty. It's also exceptionally stylish and technically brilliant. A game that looks superb in every respect, very much of its time and a prime example of top level 16-bit pixel art. The second Sega was well poised to do this type of game, it was built for it really, even if this example does go the extra mile in brilliance. It's a tile-based system, yes that's T-I-L-E, people seem to have trouble with my pronunciation of that word for some reason. Tile, like what you have in a bathroom, except not, because that's not a remotely helpful analogy. No, I'm talking about predefined blocks of pixels, very much like these here. In fact, exactly like these here, because they're taken from this very game. These tiles go together to make the two main elements of the graphics, the sprites, moving objects, and the backgrounds, arranged in the video memory and then drawn on the screen. The Genesis has two separate independent background layers or planes, both containing separate graphics which can be manipulated independently of each other, helping to create the wonder of the age, parallax scrolling. Yes, one of those things that really typified the 16-bit generation, those wonderful eye-popping backgrounds. Here on stage 2 we can see it in its classic form, and in fact these are the two separate layers that make up that background. By moving them at a different rate as the player character moves around, a sense of depth is created. A fairly simple trick when you see how it's done, but very effective, which probably explains why it was used so darn much. But hold on a moment, let's wind back to level 1, because the background there looks rather more complicated. In fact, if you go to the trouble of counting, you can see that the background appears to be in 7 separate layers, not just 2. How is this possible? Split screen scrolling is the answer. If we take a look at the background layers for this level using a debug feature of the Exodus emulator, we can see that each plane is split up into a number of different strips, each one moving at a different rate. The green highlighted sections show what is currently visible on the screen, the bits at the bottom of each plane moving faster than the bits at the top to give that depth effect. This is possible thanks to the old Mega Sissy's advanced hardware scrolling. This allowed not just the whole screen to be scrolled, but also split up and scrolled in sections. This could be in blocks of 8 pixels, or at the cost of some processing power, each row of pixels individually. It's this feature that allows for the really quite convincingly trippy 3D effect you'll see in level 3. Yes, those holes in the wall don't seem to have any other use besides showing off this effect, but I think it can be forgiven because it looks so good. How on earth is this done? Well, let's drop into that debug mode once again. Okay, the maths of it are complicated, but those weird shapes of background layer combined with some very precisely calculated scrolling splits make it happen. The green highlight shows the complex way the screen is scrolled, those arrow shapes created by scrolling just one line at a time in the relevant sections. The exact details make my head spin, but when we put it all back together, it looks fantastic. One more thing about Ranger X I really can't overlook before I move on are the superb 3D cutscenes. 
the bits between each level with the wonderfully stark synth track and the amazing minimalist 3D visuals. In an era when any sort of cutscene were not all that common, these look fabulous in an already incredibly good looking game. Despite the fact that these are set cutscenes, we know for certain that this isn't just pre-rendered stuff pulled off the cartridge, it's actually running in real time. How well the debug mode left in by the developers that lets you control the camera angles in all the scenes. Impressive stuff I think and running at a reasonable 12 frames per second. But what about the 3D technology itself? Well this is something I will come back to shortly but for now I'll say that one thing the Megasys was not made for was polygon based graphics but its architecture could handle it better than much of the competition if done in the right way. In fact, this may be our first case of Nintendon't, because whilst the Super NES was very capable of polygon graphics, it was only really any good with the aid of the Super FX chip built into the cartridge. Ranger X was done on the stock hardware with no help from this kind of thing at all. Ok, imminently to move on, but before I do, may I just interject and ask you to consider subscribing if you haven't done already, it would be much appreciated. But now onto another stunning looking thing, but with a different perspective. It's Red Zone. Released in 1994 and developed by a team with links to the Amiga demo scene, and yes it does have that sort of look about it, doesn't it? With an extremely memorable intro cementing its visual awesomeness right from the start. It's a top down action game that defies any sort of easy categorization. It's a bit like Desert Strike meets Alien Syndrome, but well that's not all that helpful. It is though unique looking amongst Mega Drive games, yes it's rather more rotational and it's got a convincing sense of depth. You might even say it has an air of, dare I say it, Mode 7 doesn't it? Now there's a lot of retro gaming enthusiasts out there, naming no names, who have a very broad definition of Mode 7, the Super NES party piece. Just about anything with more sense of depth than Pac-Man is liable to get this label. Truly though, Mode 7 was a very specific Super NES capability, the scaling and rotation of backgrounds, making them bigger and smaller and spinning them around and, well that's exactly what this has a good go at, at least in the helicopter sections. Given that the old Jenny Drive definitely does not have Mode 7 capabilities, as anyone who remembers the 90s console wars will know, how is this done? Well, before I go any further, I must say that the fantastic channel Coding Secrets, courtesy of coder John Burton, has already covered this game in some depth, and done a far better job of explaining this than I could ever hope to, so I will link to that up there and keep it brief. Basically, this rather neat rotation effect is done in three parts, one on each of the two background planes, and one on the sprite layer. The lower layer, so to speak, the green grass, actually works quite a bit like a simplified Mode 7, with a large background map rotating on a tile level. It's not as sophisticated as its SNES counterparts, and its floors are covered by a muddy colour palette, but it rotates a large backdrop in blocks of 8 pixels, instead of the per pixel rotation you'd get on the Super NES, allowing it to be done by the CPU alone without extra help of the specialised SNES graphics hardware. Going up one layer, the coastline is done with some deft manipulation of a different set of tiles. This is, once again, the kind of thing the Mega Do is really good at, and the shapes of the blobs of land are created with a bunch of pre-made tile shapes with lines at different angles. That's why it looks a bit jaggy, it's made up of a small number of preset shapes. The final element is the sprites, these are used to draw a lot of the details of the landscape and of course the player and the enemies. A lot of these elements are given a sense of depth by stacking sprites on top of each other and moving them at different rates, giving a parallax effect that works quite well. A lot of these sprites also rotate along with the backdrop, further adding to the Mode 7 like effect. Rather than using the graphics chip to automatically rotate the images as true Mode 7 would, these rotating sprites seem to be pre-rendered and the rotation is played back like an animation. 
One thing that Coding Secrets didn't discuss are the other overhead action sequences in the game, which don't have any rotation, but still have a nice looking and slightly vertigo inducing 3D effect. These interior scenes dispense with the twisty stuff, but do give us something that is very impressive in its own way if you care to delve into it. So how is this done? Well you might notice some similarity to the depth effects in Ranger X, it certainly looks like they might be using the same technique, but actually it's quite different. Ranger X is effect within a purely horizontal scrolling section, this though moves in all four directions, and that same approach wouldn't work here. Once again the Mangle Sus's two separate background planes are put to use. The floor, the part furthest away from the camera, is on one plane and the black rocky earth closest to the camera is on the other. By moving them around at different rates we get something close to the standard parallax effect, but that doesn't explain all that's going on. As this simplified view shows, just having the two layers wouldn't fully account for the perspective lines on the walls. The angles would be wrong if that was the only thing happening. Instead it's doing something similar to what we saw in the rotating helicopter section. The angles of the walls are being drawn with a bunch of tiles, like the shapes of the islands were. This gives a much more realistic perspective view that changes as the player moves around. It's not quite perfect, but it does look uncannily good at moments. Is this a case of Nintendon't? Well yes, but more of a case of Nintendon didn't than Nintendon couldn't. I personally can't think of any other game of this generation that did the same sort of things, even when the hardware was capable of it, and the SNES almost certainly was. There's enough going on in Red Zone to fill an entire episode, there are more clever visuals to anyone who wants to give it a go themselves, but let's move on once more and look at something entirely different, but still with an added dimension. Kawasaki Superbike Challenge For my money, the best looking true polygonal 3D game on the old Magic Diamond. Well, alright, second best after Virtua Racing, but we'll get to that later. Created by Lankhor Software, a French company who had previously worked on the amazing Vroom for the ST and Amiga. Yes, whilst the old Monkey Duck was a unique system with its own architecture, if you've got amazingly fast 3D running on the ST and Amiga, you're halfway to having it run here too, thanks to some basic similarities. Indeed, this game and its predecessor from the year before, F1 World Championship, does seem to be based on the same engine as Vroom, brought to the bosom of Sega. And it runs very well, it's speedy, it looks superb, it plays great, and it's just stunning to see this type of very technically challenging game zooming along so convincingly. And of course it's running completely on the stock hardware, no cheeky Nintendo style enhancement chips here. But as I mentioned before, the old Super Genital does do pretty well with 3D, even if it's not exactly what its purpose in life was supposed to be, thanks to some flexibility in its makeup. I've already explained this at length in some of my previous videos, but tile based graphics often don't work well with 3D. It's hard to construct polygons out of predefined tiles, you just don't have enough of them. What you really need is a bitmap display where you can just draw anything. Luckily though the mild donut can easily be coaxed into behaving like it does have a bitmap display, making this all so much easier. It can easily store enough unique tiles to cover the entire screen, or a good part of it, allowing a sort of pseudo bitmap display to be created. It also has the memory bandwidth to actually make use of this, just about, being able to load graphics into the video RAM quick enough for acceptable frame rates. This is helped along by the way the graphics are actually stored in the memory, called chunky pixel format if you want to get technical, which reduces processor overhead. The other part of the equation is the CPU itself, in this case the mighty Motorola 68000, very capable by the standards of the time and with enough grunt to actually do the work of drawing all those polygons quick enough for this to look good. The end result is some very decent 3D games, Kawasaki Superbike Challenge here I think, managing to eke out the best performance from this setup. 
with up to 15 frames per second depending on the mode and also making use of double buffering to cut out any screen tearing, this is a definite limit pusher that manages to achieve what it's set out to do. Is this a Nintendon't situation? Well, yes and no, depending on how you look at it, though I bet the comments below aren't quite so equivocal. Without enhancement chips, this is a definite no, the Super NES just doesn't have the power to do anything like this. The SNES version of this very same game by the very same company bears this out. It's, well, it's a lot of things, but true polygonal 3D it is not. In fact, the only game that I know of that tried to do 3D polygons without the aid of some sort of enhancement was race driving, and that wasn't pretty. Of course though, we can't ignore the Super FX chip, and with that on board, the SNES was definitely capable of some polygon pushing, but... Ah, but the old sexy gramophone had a similar trick up its sleeve too, even if it only used it once. Yes indeed, Sega's own cheeky Nintendo style enhancement chip, the Virtua Processor, and its one and only game, Virtua Racing. A surprisingly accurate conversion of the big ticket arcade showpiece, one of the first generation of games in the 90s to go full 3D, it even had multiple camera angles when that was a very rare thing indeed. This version is of course stripped back, its graphics simplified a touch but not really any slower, just quite a bit jerkier and lower on the polygon count. What is it that the Virtua Processor is doing? Well, it's not a million miles away from its opposite number, the Super FX chip. It's an add-on built into the cartridge that does the hard sums involved in 3D graphics to take the pressure off the main CPU. In fact, when you get down to it, it's not that far away from Kawasaki Superbikes, except the job of drawing the graphics is done by the Virtua Processor chip instead of being handled by the CPU itself. How does this compare with what Ninty had to offer? Well, let's not go too far down that road, but it may well be that the SVP is more powerful than the Super FX, but no one seems to have a firm answer. It's a shame it wasn't used more. Okay, now for more 3D, but of a different variety. First person shooter style raycasting. In fact, we have a bit of a choice here. A fine showing from this brief section in Toy Story, no less. A very impressive game all round, coded by coding secrets John Burton, I believe. So, kudos to him. A very smooth 3D environment with some detailed texture mapping. Nicely done. Similarly impressive is Bloodshot, and this time it's a complete game and not just a single level. Maybe not quite so smooth, it seems to be running at less than 10 frames per second, but it does look very impressive indeed for a console from this generation. But you might notice something a little odd about both this and Toy Story's 3D if you really look. It's vertically symmetrical, the top half of the 3D graphics are exactly the same as the bottom, but flipped over. A sneaky hack to cut down on the amount of processing needed, and increase the frame rate, it being quite easy to invert the graphics tiles as they are drawn on the screen. If we remove everything else from the scene, it becomes even more obvious. The enemies and collectibles are done with sprites overlaid on the top and don't follow the same rule. Cleverly, a bit of variety can be added by manipulating the palette when the graphics are flipped over. The inscription on this door is exactly the same at the top and the bottom. You just can't see it because that blue colour is turned to grey. But we can do better, maybe? Something even more impressive, perhaps? A 90s heavy hitter? It's Duke Nukem 3D. Released in 1998, not quite the last commercial mullet drone game, but close, from Brazilian company Tech Toy. Yes, those guys, the same ones who brought Street Fighter 2 to the Master System. Was this official? Well, no one seems to know, but lord, it was an impressively brave porting attempt. 
not quite true to the source material, it's more Wolfenstein than Duke really when it comes to the gameplay, but still it's pretty incredibly sophisticated. I'm struggling to think of anything on the similarly spec original STs or Amigas that looked this good. Yes, this is running on stock hardware, no crazy expansions jammed in the cart, and it doesn't even seem to be using the vertical symmetry trick either, and the frame rate is, well, pretty decent. So what's going on? How did they squeeze so much performance out of the old menthol dirigible? Well, as I said, the top and bottom parts of the screen are not identical like they were in Bloodshot. There are a lot of textures that easily show that. Also, the enemies are not done with sprites, but drawn on the background layer too. There seem to be some shortcuts taken when there are repeating patterns, but this is all a touch more sophisticated. But let's take a closer look at the graphics here, because there are an awful lot of vertical lines. It's like looking through very tiny jail bars. You might think that this is some sort of dithering thing, a common technique where patterns of dots can be used to simulate more colours and that may be a side effect, but it's not the main reason. No, it looks like that because it's only alternate lines that are being rendered. Like Bloodshot and Toy Story, it's only half the screen being drawn, but this time each alternating vertical line instead of one complete half. Saving lots of time and allowing a higher frame rate whilst getting around the obvious drawbacks of the mirroring technique. Why is it done with vertical strips instead of with horizontal scan lines? Well, number one, when viewing this on a much more forgiving analogue TV, those vertical stripes disappear and we get just bands of colour like you would do with the standard dithering technique. Yes, it looks quite a bit better with a touch of blur, doesn't it? Also, this technique just happens to be easier to do with vertical lines on this system's architecture. It's just mathematically a bit simpler, making it an obvious choice. Even taking this into account, the frame rate is still very good at around 15 frames per second much of the time. Better than Bloodshot and better than the majority of 3D stuff you'll see on this console. It really is very well done. Interestingly, it isn't double buffered. The graphics are drawn directly onto the screen in chunks across three frames rather than all popping up at once. If I slow it right down, you can see this happening. Done, I think, because of a lack of memory. There doesn't seem to be enough space left in the video RAM to do it any other way. This is far from the best port of Duke, of course. It plays like a Duke-themed Wolfenstein mod and it's really, really stupidly difficult, even on the easy mode. I've no idea why they made it so darn hard, I cheated like I was going for a Minecraft speedrun to get this footage, but what an achievement it is. Nintendo, well this could be controversial, but without the Super FX chip, nothing on the SNES looked quite this good, though an official port of Wolfenstein gave it a good go. With the Super FX chip, in fact the Super FX 2, we have Doom, which is, um, well, it's the SNES version of Doom. Not great, not terrible. So, is Duke Nukem the most impressive game on the old Sago Mega Pudding? Well, it could be, it might be, but there's another candidate for your consideration that, depending on your point of view, might even top the antics of Mr. Nukem. But before I reveal that, let me slide in a brazen plug for my Patreon. Yes, if you'd like to help me out a bit, that would be fantastic. Just follow the links. Okay, then back to the games, and what is it? Well, it's Panorama Cotton. a cute witch rails shooter and a rare Japanese Mega Drive exclusive. A game that could easily have been designed from the ground up to be a rare hard to find collector's item. An intoxicating blend of high-end 90s pixel art and technical mastery. They made 47 copies and buried most of them in a field in Hokkaido as tradition dictates that Japanese developers must do from time to time, meaning that wow, this is not cheap. But also, wow, doesn't it look good. A series of very strikingly smooth, multicoloured 3D backdrops that many would be chomping at the bit to call Mode 7. 
It's not, of course, the term makes no sense outside of the SNES architecture and anyway this works entirely differently, even if there is some superficial similarity. There's loads of stuff we could talk about, but well let's start at the beginning shall we? Yes this is level 1 with a desert scene that with a slow descent reveals a very zigzaggy, well, rainbow road. Already this is impressive because this is an effect unlike anything else I can think of on the old Sugar Gymnasium, it's quite unique. Let's take a look at the background for this level as it's stored in the system's memory. Yes, it looks very unzaggy and not nearly so ziggy or so 3D. What's happening? Well, it's some very advanced scrolling manipulation. Very advanced indeed, as it turns out. You know, it might be a bit too much for my meagre brain, but I'll give it a go. Now, it would be great if I could use the debug scrolling highlighter like I did before with Ranger X, but well, it, well, it seems like this game throws it out of whack a bit. Okay then, let's try a different tack. We can split this up into two separate parts to examine the depth effect of the road stretching off into the horizon and the windy zigzag effect. With the depth effect, we can make it a bit clearer by turning off the horizontal scrolling entirely. It sort of messes other things up as well, but well, that's okay because we can see how this works more easily. The background here is in two independent sections, the sky and the track itself. When the player sprite moves up and down, so does the horizon, simulating a real shift in perspective. But also, and this is the cool part, it seems like the track gets zoomed in too. How's this done? Well, it skips drawing some lines of the track, making it look squashed, at the same time as lowering the horizon, creating foreshortening. I think so anyway, it's either that or magic, whatever it is, it's a very efficient way of adding a scaling effect. What about the skewiness of the track? Well, this is horizontal scrolling manipulation at work there. Parts of the track are scrolled left and right in bands moving up the screen, a bit like the strips that were moved separately in Ranger X. This is a trick often used in old school racing games to give a road curves here, applied in a slightly different way. I should also point out that the very first part of the level with the windy track in the distance works a little differently. Here, lines of pixels are repeated to make the track longer rather than squished shorter, but with the same horizontal windy trick added as well. What about the perspective shifts when you move left and right? How's that done? Well, more scrolling malarkey, lines moving at different rates, this time similar to the deep holes from Ranger X, the complexity added to the already complex picture. And Lord, it gets worse too. What's going on with this crazy chasm at the end of the level? Weirdly, this seems to be a case of more repeating lines of pixels. Another background map this time with strips of that rainbow waterfall in different sizes. These are redrawn all the way down the screen, switching to the larger ones in stages to create a zoom effect. A similar trick is used, I think, to create this stairs effect from this stage, bits of the track repeated to make the vertical part of each step. It really is madness, and it just goes on and on, each level throwing out so much insane virtuoso Mega Drive mastery. I could easily make a whole video about this sole game, and maybe I will do one day. I haven't even got onto Stage 2's checkerboard pattern or the lunacy of Level 1, but now there are two tracks in the memory, and it alternates between them to create that pattern. Then it mirrors it on the ceiling, and then there's other tracks you can follow, and... Well, if you couldn't see it yourself, you'd probably think I was making it up. A game I heartily recommend you try out if you ever get the chance. Another Nintendon't moment? Kind of. SNES game Hyperzone is a real Mode 7 game that's quite similar, but I think Panorama Cotton fairly easily puts that in the shade. Star Fox must also be up for consideration, of course, but, well, that's an entirely different graphical beast, and there's not really anything quite like this on any system. Yes, Panorama Cotton is a pearl of a game, and certainly a limit pusher. Somewhere in my personal top 10 all-time limit pushing us games on any system, definitely. And I think a good place to call time on this video. Have I missed stuff out? Oh yes, I know, I know, there's loads and loads. I've not mentioned anything from Treasure, there's no Batman, no fighting games. Please feel free to let me know in the comments what you think I've missed. I love the Megasys and I'm sure I'll be coming back this way sometime. 
But maybe I have enough time to answer the ultimate question, why was it that they switched names when it came to North America? Well, thereby hangs a tale. You see, the name Mega Drive was already trademarked in the US as a heavy-duty laxative, so a name change was needed. What were Sega going to call it? Well, obviously you need to name it after a prog rock band, but which one? Various names were put before focus groups of radical kids, the Sega King Crimson, the Sega Emerson Lake and Palmer, the Sega Alan Parsons Project, but ultimately the Sega Genesis won out and the rest is history. Interestingly enough, the working title of Sonic was actually The Hedgehog Lies Down on Broadway, and The Labyrinth Zone was originally envisaged as a 14 minute drum solo. Okay, okay, I'm making all this up. That's not what happened at all. It was named after the book in the Bible, A Wise Choice. The Sega second epistle to the Thessalonians was always going to be a bit of a mouthful. Right, this is definitely the moment to call it a day. Thanks for watching, folk. If you've hit that like button and now you've changed your mind, you've still got time to unclick it. And I'll see you next time. Massive thanks, as always, to my generous patrons. If you'd like to join them, click on the link below and I'll say goodbye.